My name's Will Schmier. Welcome back to another episode of the Wubble Survival Podcast. In today's episode, we are going to take a little bit of a turn to the previous three episodes in this podcast and go a little bit different direction. We're going to talk about successes and wins because this podcast is about the struggles and successes that a survivor and the caretaker and the families Everybody a part of the survivor journey may face, may be challenged with, may have to overcome, so on and so forth. So in today's episode, I, you know, I want to talk about some of the wins. I do kind of want to get back to, you know, this is a serious topic, obviously, stroke, stroke survivals, brain injury, any, any any sort of, any neurological event or any life-altering, life-changing event is a big deal. And I don't want to make light of that. But I think, in my experience, part of overcoming that is being able to find the silver linings, have some fun, be funny, enjoy life. You know, you have the opportunity to really make something of this second chance. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you did some things that were you were proud of. You know, everybody has a unique story. And in my case, I had a pretty good run. I was doing pretty well by all accounts. I just had some things that, for whatever reason, I struggled with. You know, some of it I kept quiet about. I didn't really ask for help. Of course, in hindsight, yeah, I would rather ask for help now, you know, but now I know. And that's why I think I am so passionate about making this, you know, second chance really valuable and, and why I want to share my journey and some of the things I've gone through in the last three years with others because I want to give them hope. I want to share funny stories share the wins, share the struggles. It is about friendship and finding other people who may be in a similar place, you know, because it can get very lonely. So again, on this episode, we're going to talk about some wins, some successes. I'm going to kind of highlight a few of mine. They're unique to me because I've been through them. But what I do want to share about those is kind of the lessons learned and things that you might be able to apply from the specific win for me and extracting some of that, some of those lessons that I've learned and apply them to your specific issue, maybe a problem you're having, maybe it's something you're looking to overcome. It could be questioning some things. I, I think it's going to be a really good episode today. And you know, with that, I, I I do want to share one of my favorite stories from the second time I went to inpatient rehab in 2020. So to recap the story real quick, I had my stroke December of 2019. I went into Brooks Rehab, inpatient rehab care for stroke survivors here in Jacksonville, Florida in January of 2020. I spent 30 days doing a lot of the early physical therapy work that anybody who goes to inpatient will probably do, either that exact program or something very similar. In my case, it was relearning sort of the bigger motor skills. My stroke was not classified as a catastrophic or major stroke, but it was pretty, in hindsight, it was a pretty big deal. Um, for me, I think for Ali, for anybody, I had a stroke that paralyzed the majority of the right-hand side of my body, which means it affected the left side of my brain. So for those who may be unfamiliar, the side of the brain that the stroke affects determines then typically which side of your body has some lingering effects. It can vary. It could just be upper body. It could just be lower body. Very commonly, survivors and family and people who are really involved will know every stroke is different. Absolutely true. 
And again, that's why some of these wins that I'm going to talk about today might be specific to me, but I think there are very much things that you can extract and hopefully apply and take, you know, either a deeper look or a second look and apply them to things you're doing either as a survivor, as a caretaker, as a family member. I, I, I think it's good to talk, talk things out. Whether you're the survivor, the care, main caretaker, a family member. Again, we all have a role to play in helping, um, whether it's helping yourself, helping the other person, helping family members, helping, you know, the people that are helping because they also need support. It really, it sounds corny, but it is a collaborative effort and everybody's role is crucial, I think, to the success ultimately of everybody saying, making it through, making it through healthy, positive to the individual survivor. Obviously, the support is immense, but make no mistake about it. It can, it can take a toll on everybody involved. So I think that is why support and collaboration is super important when it comes to stroke and stroke recovery. So yeah, going back to one of my early kind of fails. Now this is a little bit funny because I was in inpatient rehab. I left January at the end of January of 2020 in a wheelchair. I think I said before I was home for a week. Wound up thinking I was having a second stroke, going back to the hospital, spending a couple of weeks there. Ultimately got diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, MS for short, which is a heck of a lot easier to say than multiple sclerosis. Anyways, I got to go back to inpatient rehab, the same facility here in Jacksonville, middle of February, beginning of March 2020 before COVID. So I went back for the second time in the first quarter of 2020. And one one of the things I did there that I kind of look back on, it's funny, but it's also silly and slightly dangerous. Um, I think it's important to note that when you are in a wheelchair, you find yourself wheelchair bound suddenly for any reason, it is imperative that you pay attention it can be difficult. It can feel constricting, confining. It's, it's a real adjustment. You might be there short term, you might be there long term. It, 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 I don't think anybody knows necessarily how long they're going to be there. Um, but one of the mistakes I made was I thought I knew better very much because I was in my mid-30s at the time of my stroke. Just thought I could handle things. (laughs) So I thought it was so stupid to have a seatbelt in the wheelchair. Long story short, I was trying to get back, you know, as most survivors are, are trying to get back to good health, trying to figure out how to manage day to day. I got a little excited. I have no idea why. I could not walk yet. I wasn't barely, I think, just starting to try a walker. In my second trip to rehab. Anyways, I'm also very impatient. And I was sitting in my room one day and I was taking off my shoe for some reason. I have no idea why. I don't know if there was an itch. I, it fell off the wheelchair, basically off my, I think I took it off my foot. I put it on my lap. The shoe fell out of my lap onto the floor. I'm still not walking. I can't get out of the wheelchair. I should not be getting out of the wheelchair. I don't have my seatbelt on. Because I'm just sitting. Lo and behold, shoe falls out onto the floor. And I think, hmm, I should get that shoe and put it back on my foot. Well, yeah, maybe. But maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should just wait and call the nurse because I'm not going to walk anywhere. There's no reason for me to get my shoe. It's just on the floor. It's not a big deal. Anyways, long story short, I try to get it. I ended up falling out of my wheelchair. <laughs> now, I have been in this rehab facility now for the, this is the second time I've been there a full 30 days prior. This is probably halfway through. I fall out of my wheelchair. It's not a huge deal. I was at the, at the time, I was still over 400 pounds. But it's embarrassing because I can't walk. I can't pick my shoe up. I've fallen out of my wheelchair. I can't get back up. 
because I'm paralyzed. It just was a mess and they made a huge deal out about it. They were freaking out. It was not really that big of a deal, but it, you would have thought you would have thought the world was ending. They had all these people, medical staff. I mean, good God, I, I accidentally, because of my stupidity of trying to grab my shoe, I disrupted the entire stroke floor because they needed to get me off the floor, which, you know, in fairness, I didn't want to be on the floor, but also in fairness, it was my fault. So it was a big to do is super embarrassing. And again, at that time, I was so big, they couldn't just pick me up. They had to get the machine from the other side of the hospital. And yeah, it was a whole big mess. So if you are still in a rehab facility and find yourself in a wheelchair or you're still in a wheelchair period, please don't do what I did. Please be smart. Please be safe. Especially if you can't walk and you're not able to really grab things yet. Don't try to grab it. Just wait. Just ask somebody. And what was I going to do? Just put my shoe back on? Sit in my wheelchair? Like, think about that. Think about how I just, yeah, I don't know. It was embarrassing. But I thought I'd share that story kind of as a as a funny little fail from the beginning. And, you know, just try to lighten the mood here on this podcast. But yeah, so that was, that was a, that was a time. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure my nurses, I mean, we just, we endlessly made fun of it for the next two or three weeks while I was still doing rehab at the inpatient hospital. You know, I never like to keep it boring. I always like to keep it lively. I do recommend that again. Like I said, please be safe. If you're unable to walk yet, just uh, yeah, well, actually, that kind of segues into our first topic in successes. And one of the big wins for me, I think, initially early on, and I'm kind of doing this in reverse order. So uh, for me, I think when I first had my stroke, obviously, we've talked about it on this show already, and I've talked about it at length and at nauseum. But for new listeners, you know, walking was something I was paralyzed on the entire right hand side of my body. And being six foot eight, 300, now I'm 300 plus pounds. Um, I had been six, eight the whole time, but at the time of my stroke, I was closer to 500 pounds or just shy, you know, but I knew walking was going to be a, a big one. <laughs> and that isn't just because it is kind of one of, I would consider one of everybody's and for those that are able to walk, it is kind of the main motor skill, I would say. Um, you know, I think that TPD, everybody's got different thoughts there, but walking was a big one for me. And one that I focused on intensely in the beginning, because I think if you get back to walking, that's how you start to change your health. And it, I think by all accounts, when you talk to therapists, occupational, physical therapists, walking is sort of the big skill to regain that starts to build your confidence in many other areas that might be affected by stroke. So walking was a big one and it took me, you know, and I realized coming out of inpatient, being out of inpatient in February, 2020, Briefly, before going back, the world is not kind to wheelchairs and accessibility. I think we've seen that over the years that the world just isn't kind in general, but it is particularly harsh, not even intentionally sometimes. It's just, you know, my wife is deaf, so she is a deaf woman living in a hearing world. I see those struggles on the daily. I experience them with her. You know, when I was in the wheelchair, I was big, but I don't think it matters what size your wheelchair is. I think it is just, you know, the world really isn't built for wheelchairs. You know, and I think the sometimes that's, <laughs> that could be for a variety of reasons. You know, but I, I just wanted to get back to walking because for me, being 6'8", I'm not used to being anywhere near the level of sitting all day long. 
you know, and it took me several months to get from wheelchair to starting to use a walker. It took me another good six months probably of using the walker on eventually I went from wheelchair to walker to a cane to a cane with a brace to just the brace on its own and the brace was to help with my drop foot because when you have a stroke again this is dependent on your stroke and the individual what drop foot is is where you know your foot just it's a little i mean it is what it is it's 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 it it just it, things are not quite a hundred percent so it does take some time you know you have to build up strength i think that's one of the strangest things about having a stroke is that one day you're fine and the neurological event that happens when you have a stroke like by all accounts you should <laughs> you would think have the same strength in your leg but it just doesn't work that way so you know, over the course of most of 2020, it took some adjusting and with time it started to get better. And eventually I got to a place of walking. And again, with walking, it's it's still not perfect, but it is a much significantly better. I don't need a wheelchair. I don't need a walker. I don't need a cane. However, with having MS, I think it's taken a little bit longer. And there is the potential that I could short term need a wheelchair, which is why I have a wheelchair, a power wheelchair. I've just really also taken advantage of this time to improve my health. But that is for a separate episode, I think, because that deserves a full episode in and of itself. And honestly, so does walking. But I think when I think about walking and the path that I've taken to get better at walking over the last three years, it it really can feel annoying to the individual in the moment. It can even feel painful to, again, the caretaker and family because it's slow. You might be lucky. It might take less time. You, you might be super lucky and you might not have any deficits when it comes to walking. But chances are there's something similar, you know, where one person like myself might have some deficits from the stroke in walking. Other people might have shoulder pain. They might have, um, you know, other motor skill issues. I, I think it's kind of a give and take and it's just depending on your situation. Unfortunately, it's, it's not a super clear cut and dry thing. It's not as simple as, you know, I was talking to my daughter the other day when, when you have a stroke, it's not as clear as, you know, when you break a bone, you break a finger, you break even an arm, you know, it's six to eight weeks in a cast. It's a couple months, maybe a rehab at most, but it's, it's kind of short term. With a stroke, it could be permanent. It could be short term. It could be long term. It, gosh, it, it stinks to hear, but it, it really depends. And the hardest thing I think is that it does take time. And even with patience and chipping away, you know, it's still taking me three years. It could take longer. Or it could take less. I, I think that's one of the hardest things is that you can put in a certain amount of work in any facet of your life after after a stroke or brain injury. And it's not quite as clear. You don't know how much you work or how much time. Uh, you know, and I tried that too early on. I tried to put in a ton of work when I was at rehab and I think it helped certainly, but I don't think there was no like clear cut. Like if you put in 2000 hours, you'll be good when 2000 hours is up because I would have put 2000 hours in to fix everything as fast as I could have. You know, that's one of the hard things to wrap. Uh, it took me a while to wrap my head around. It still is to this day, three plus years into this. So the next topic I want to touch on today is, you know, and I, I think we've kind of wrapped up what walking is and that metaphor for things and chipping away. But the next topic again is breathing. Now this is a huge topic. And I think I might just kind of combine this with my last one. So breathing is something that 
people brought to my attention during rehab, if you've been to a hospital, you know, they give you the spirometer. They tell you to work on your breathing. One, they hand you the spirometer and they basically throw it on your tray table. And they're like, yeah, breathe when you have time. Okay. <laughs> Not helpful. Uh, nobody suggests, you know, now in hindsight, it's so obvious, right? Like watch, watch a YouTube video of people using this. Watch TikTok. Watch anything. Read more information. But I'm going to talk about breathing because I thought last year, actually, when I was kind of figuring out where I wanted to go next with my business and coaching practice, I thought I might become a full-time breathing coach after having had my eyes open to a world that I totally ignored. I think a lot of people, myself included, overestimate or underestimate in that in that sense, how important breathing is to our lives. Breathing improves circulation, just general well-being. There are so many benefits to breathing that I think are often overlooked, really not discussed because I think, and this is just what I think, and this is what I've heard from People who are in the know, people who are very kind of well-known in the breathing community, who I'll talk about in a little bit, we take it for granted. We all know the importance of breathing that plays in our life to a degree. How much we know is actually probably not as much as we think. We're going to just say these things from my perspective. I think I did not ever realize how much of a mouth breather I was. Now, when I say mouth breather, I don't necessarily mean what you probably think. I don't mean somebody who is just, you can hear from 10 feet away. I mean, yeah, I, I am talking about them, but also there are plenty of people who are kind of mouth breathers and they might be a little aware, like myself, I was aware, slightly self-conscious. I was a former smoker, but I knew it wasn't like terrible because I either was mindful of it when I was in public or I just I think until you really pay attention, you may not even realize. Because again, I will say with breathing, we all sort of know how to breathe. We, 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 it's not something we think about it because it happens involuntary. And if we're not breathing, we sure as hell know right away that we are not breathing. And there is a problem. Our brain is telling us there is a problem. There is a major malfunction. We know if we're not breathing at all, right? But until you pay attention to your breathing, you don't really know. And I will tell you this. I, for a very long time, most of my life, have brushed off any thought of breathing because I would hear terms like breath work. Huh. Well, that sounds annoying. That sounds like some I don't even know what. That sounds like something that's a waste of my time and I don't want to hear about it because it just sounds stupid. However, however, had somebody prior to last year grabbed me by the face and said, Will, you had a stroke. You had undiagnosed sleep apnea. Can I suggest you read a book? or two, or three, or four. You are, in fact, a mouth breather. While that is not technically problematic, you have been a mouth breather and a heavy mouth breather for the majority of your life. That is put your body under a surprisingly amount of undue stress that you could simply change with a little bit of effort. So I will go into this today and we could probably do a much longer in-depth episode on breathing specifically. And now full disclosure, I believe somebody mentioned this book to me. I believe it was my sister. And then I believe somebody else mentioned the book to me in 2021, but neither time did anybody say you need to read this book. Now, 
Full disclosure, the second person doesn't know me that well. The first person was my sister, Kat, who I love, who knows she probably should tell me and yell at me to my face. When she thinks something's important, I will absolutely listen. If she says, Will, listen to me, hear me out. I'm listening. I believe we're all probably guilty of this. When somebody says something casually, it doesn't necessarily make me stop, pause, and think. However, as usual, 18 months after she mentioned it, (laughs) I fell upon it again last summer. I read Breath by James Nestor. It is a book well worth reading if you are a, and I will tell you why, a couple of reasons. If you're a stroke survivor who maybe had undiagnosed sleep apnea, maybe you're looking for some early solutions, but walking is difficult. Maybe you're in a wheelchair like I found myself. You know, in hindsight, this would have been a terrific opportunity while in a wheelchair to do some work physically. Now, I did. Mind you, there were there were lots of machines at Brooks Rehab. Those machines, once you leave rehab, they do not come with you necessarily. So once you get home and you're in a wheelchair, still you're a little limited. Breathing would have been a great thing for me to really get into. And I did, full disclosure, in 2020, get into some things. I don't know if that's because of COVID or because I am somewhat of a maniac and insist on trying to find solutions and was voraciously reading every book, finding everything I could find from other stroke survivors, some of which was good, some of which wasn't very helpful for me. There is a ton of doctoral information for people going into the profession of, of being a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, tons of information, stories of other individuals, less information of things that other individuals are trying to do. Which is one of the reasons for this podcast. I just want to share what I know, what's inside my head with other people, because it serves no purpose just staying up in my head. It's worked for me. Some of it hasn't. And I want to share that too. Like this didn't work for me. Maybe it'll work for you. Like my whole goal with this podcast is to share knowledge. Because I don't think there are tons of survivors who are able to either do this or want to do this kind of stuff. Not everybody's as open as I am. Like I'm a very big dude who no longer works for a company. I am, I have my own businesses. Like I can kind of say what I want, do a degree. I can push back. I can tell you things that this has absolutely worked. This absolutely hasn't worked. This may work for you. I'm not holding it to anybody. Like I just, again, my main goal is to, to kind of share the information that has worked for me because I was looking for this a couple of years ago. So, so that's why I'm doing this podcast and eventually hopefully doing some YouTube, whether that's individual videos or this podcast with guests or a mixture of both. Because I feel like, a spe- I mean, there's just not a ton of information. Think about it. Most stroke survivors are 65 and older. Not a lot of 65 and older YouTubers, but I'm sure there's a market for it. And I'm sure there are ones that will be doing it. And in recent years, I don't know if it's because of COVID or the vaccine or some kind of combination. I I don't know what's going on. I don't know the history of stroke, honestly, because I never paid attention until I had my stroke, which happened to be right before COVID. So like there does seem like an uptick in stroke survivors under 65. I'd love to see some new information. In fact, I should probably go digging that. But yeah, breathing real quick. You know, this episode is going a little long, but. If you're interested, I think it's a great thing for any stroke survivor because breathing has a lot of on it, like a lot of benefits. And I think how it affects the individual is going to vary based on your, your scenario and how, how you're currently breathing. But I think, I think there are lots of promising benefits that are often overlooked. You know, you can think about it as a survivor. You, Maybe you don't deal with this, but I certainly do. You know, I don't think it's anxiety necessarily, but your life has changed, you know? So breathing 
you hear people talk about breathing at a very surface level, um, you know, but I, I started to explore. And I think when you read breath, if you read breath by James Nestor, it's a great book. Another one I'm going to recommend is the oxygen advantage by Patrick McGowan, full disclosure. I've done work with him to get certified with the oxygen advantage. They just released an app. He has a second book that was released in 2021. I think breathing cure also really good. Very simple exercises that you can teach yourself. I, I, I think I'm going to build out part of my community with some breath work because I think once you get past that terminology and you start to realize, oh, it's just breathing exercises, it really opens up a whole world. And again, there's a ton of stuff I could talk about with breathing. You know, and things that I had overlooked and, and things that I really recommend. And just, just for, for the sake of recommending a fourth book here, I just want to recommend Breathe by Melissa Vranick. Also a really good book. What I like about all these books is it's, they're all sort of, Breath is sort of the high level overarching book. Um, James Nestor was an investigative journalist. He looked into the art of breathing. I think there's a lot of info there. Patrick and Belinda's books are very specific. Patrick is great. Belinda seems great. I've never met her. They have a lot of techniques that can help you when you're getting started with breathing. Um, sort of tips and tricks. Like, for example, I'll just give you one right off the bat here, even though we're going long today. Is that, I'll be honest, I have done a ton of radio and voiceover work in the past. I've been around people. I knew the importance of nasal breathing, but I, I, two huge things for me that really clicked with Patrick. I saw a video where he showed you how to unblock your nose. That for me was a game changer. Once I realized you could naturally unblock your nose. That was a huge first step for me in, in really getting into breathing. And then Belinda I think what I liked about hers in particular was her belly breathing. It, it sounds so silly when you read it at first and you're like, and you read it and you're like, how did I not understand this before? And I don't know, maybe you do, maybe you don't have no problem nasal breathing and maybe you're, you're, you know, I hope your breathing is great, but I think it's a, a really underestimated thing that nobody in the medical community had mentioned to me until I got into breath work this past summer. And started going down this rabbit hole and then again, talking to Patrick and taking some of his classes, getting certified as an oxygen bandage coach, you know, and again, again, I think the the last thing I'll say is (laughs) it's funny too, with the diaphragm, you hear about it, people talk about it all the time, but it was always confusing to me. And I never asked because I was too shy to ask anybody. Like, I don't understand. And then I found out. Well, the reason you don't really feel your diaphragm is because it has no nerve endings. It's just, <laughs> and I had never thought, probably because I was young and stupid, I never thought to look at an actual image of where the diaphragm was and how it actually worked because that was another game changer for me. So anyways, please do look into breathing if you are a recent stroke survivor or if it's, it's definitely probably, I would say one of the biggest things that has opened my eyes in the last couple of months, probably last nine months now, huge, huge, huge game changer. And again, I think if I had known about it sooner, it would have been more, you know, it's fine. I mean, I'm happy to know about it now, but it would have been useful, especially in the early days when I was in a wheelchair. It was, you know, it's just something you could work on while you're not necessarily able to walk. So anyways, I think we're going to kind of wrap it up for this episode. I do want to mention a couple of things. I am in the process of creating a new website that's a little more interactive so I could start to get some newsletters out, some some guests booked on this podcast. You know, we're going to see where that goes. So there will be a new revamped website coming out 
And again, I think a newsletter would be great because there's a lot of details sometimes that get missed or forgotten on a particular show. And although the goal is to bring them up again on the next show or another show, I think there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity there for, I want to be able to connect to everybody. And then the last thing I'll say is, again, I think I've talked about it before, but I am in the process of building out a survivor community, specifically brain injury survivors. At first, we'll see the direction that takes in the early stages of planning that out. I've had the tool for a while, but I really want to make sure it's planned out in a smart way so that we're all able to benefit from building a community. But together, it will be membership piece. Yeah, and we'll we'll see. The goal is to build it out for everybody, and that's uh, you can head over to SurvivorScience.com and check that out. So you can get uh, notified when we launch, and to let everybody know. Uh,